Good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you are. Welcome uh, to this, uh, this webinar. I'm Mary Jane Parmentier. I'm the Interim Director for the Center for Maghreb Studies here at Arizona State University. I want to first acknowledge on behalf of CMS that we're located on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations. We thank the native communities of the Salt River Valley, including the Akamal Odom and the Peeposh nations who have inhabited this place for centuries. Um, and whose stewardship of the land and waterways allows us to be here today. So my, it is my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Adip Ben Sharif. He is an assistant professor at Sherbrooke University, which is um, near Montreal and it's snowing there, I understand, or there's snow on the ground. So um, we're a little bit warmer here in Arizona. Um, but Dr. Ben Sharif, uh, without further ado, you can go ahead and screen share again and start your presentation. We really appreciate your being with us today. And also for everyone, if you have questions that occur to you as you go, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and then um, at the very end of the talk, I'll mediate um, questions and answers, and we hope to have a really um, robust and open conversation. Thank you. Thank you a lot for this invitation. It's very appreciated. Yes, it's snowing right now, which is quite different than like the weather in Arizona, I guess. But um, but yeah, so uh, we are not in the Sahara right now, but at some point we're work, uh, working on um, presenting on Twerk Woman will help me to see myself in another weather. So um, about like this topic, just to give you some context, uh, the presentation is like quite expensive. I'm going to be very exploratory in, uh, in that sense that uh, it's at the same time some data that I collected from my field work uh, mainly in Mali on Tuareg women and uh, some um, data that I'm starting to collect for a book. So it's like a half contents of a scientific article that I'm working on Tuareg women in their role in the last Malian conflict. And at the same time, more something transversal, very interdisciplinary that I'm starting in a book where my, um, when my goal is like to, um, to try to explore the representations on, this, um, on these figures and uh, to, to, to criticize, to analyze the various biases existing uh, here, there. Uh, masculinist biases, traditional one, and at some point orientalist too. So uh, just to, I'm gonna try to continue. Yeah, just to give you some context, you, the Tuareg are like, uh, the classic storytelling about the Tuareg is to say that they are nomadic people uh, that we can find mainly in Algeria, Libya, Morocco, uh, Mali, Niger, and uh, Burkina Faso. Of course you have now, um, some Tuareg living in Morocco too, in Mauritania, more and more are like living also in West. You have an important diaspora existing, uh, notably in France, but not only. Uh, so um, we need to be cautious when we like um, telling the story of Tuareg living as nomads only in that area that we are like defining here in this map but also as only nomads, because some of them are like now living as more sedentary people. But what's interesting in general when you're talking with Tuareg is that even if they're not anymore uh, living as nomad pastoralists, they are still referring to this uh, representation of the world or they keeping like a sentimental um, link with this world. So uh, many of you know that uh, a conflict started in 2012 and at some point, some rebel groups, um, some Tuareg rebel groups were able to um, conquer a territory that they called Azawad. They claiming the independence of Azawad since the nineties, by the way, because we had Tuareg rebellion in the nineties in Mali and at the same time in Niger. Um, so except that in 2012, you had like jihadist groups also, which, led to many to to a lot of confusion about like what are the actors of this insurgency and we can talk about it later that's not the, the focus on this paper so when i started to work on Tuareg rebellions because it was my um uh, the topic of my dissertation uh i was mainly 
um, exchanging, uh, interviewing um, elites. And when I was like interviewing these elites, it was mainly men. And I remember during a methodological class uh, during my PhD, a feminist scholar who was um, studying um, Canad the Canadian administration told me, but where are the women in your topic? And at that moment, I, I was like, well, they're not mainly political elites. I can find some, but when I'm like going to meet um, uh, traditional chiefs or like uh, warlords, it's going to be men. So I'm not choosing to have only men, but at some point my topic is leading it to me. So basically, I was like more like blaming my topic than myself. And I was OK with that. But when I was doing my fieldwork, I discovered that a lot of men were talking about the Twerg woman, particularly after the Algiers peace agreement in 2015. Normally, at that moment, uh, the Malian state and the Twerg rebels were like agree on an, a, on a peace agreement and to stop like basically the rebellion. But a lot of leaders, Twerg leaders, were telling me, les femmes sont devenues incontrôlables. The Twerg women are now uncontrollable. So I was like, okay, what's happening behind it? Uh, they seem to not understand even their own communities. And there's like a gender bias in my own topic, but also my, my the actors that I'm interviewing don't understand what's happening exactly in their, in their world. So women were not anymore represented only as victims, but were represented also as part of like, as key actors of the conflict. So my main, question at the beginning when I was like trying to understand what was happening with Tuareg women was like, how is the rebellion of Tuareg women after the peace agreement revealing layers of symbolic violence? Basically, why they disagree with this peace agreement? The, there's something behind it. What are the role plays by the Tuareg women in the different Tuareg rebellions in the past to see if the role evolved at some point, and why were they protesting then after the peace agreement in 2015? So that was like my initial questions, but I'm gonna work on this and at the same time try to be very transversal because now I'm like, I opened the discussion to explore it through different uh, channels. Uh, and it's more about representations. For example, I, I'm like working on like poetry contents co collected by Dominique Casajus. I'm like uh, trying to, I'm um, like working on novels, even like local ones, it's not only international one, it's interesting to read Algerian novels, for example, uh, and their way of representing this, uh, the, the Tuareg in general, which can be linked to uh, Berber identities, but also a form of Orientalism sometimes. So it's interesting to see the kind of mixture happening uh, in that um, in that word media contents I'm gonna share with you some analysis that we already did with like one of my students and movies for example Timbuktu when you have a very uh, uh, classic representation like cliche representation of the Tuareg woman so uh, to also and the uh, exploratory um, way of looking at the literature in social sciences historians anthropologists like uh, uh, Ellen Clodo Awad, who did like an important work on this topic, even if she was not necessarily addressing it directly. Um, you have Suzanne Rasmussen, who, uh, which is like, uh, who's a very interesting um, uh, scholar. Um, uh, Amalia Dragani, who observed it through the poetry on women. So you have like some scholars who focus on some aspects, and I'm trying to make sense of all of that. Um, I did field works in Mali and Niger. My main, the main actors that I interviewed were like Tuareg elites. At some point, I found a way to meet with Tuareg women. Some were like, like Nina Wallet in Talu, like definitely a Tuareg leader. But others, it was more about like informal discussions and more their role as peace brokers. We'll talk later about it, I guess, during the question. And yeah, I told you the initial stories that I had androcentric biases and I discovered it in the field. So just as um, to, to play a little bit with like some ambiguities existing when we're thinking about the Tuareg women, um, oh, we are quite often considering that it's like a matriarchy. So basically against the patriarchy, it's like a, an idealized society, like the Kurd when you have like strong women. And at some point, 
um, that we are representing, uh, represented, we are representing this world as opposed to the Muslim Arab societies, when here it's like way more progressist. You have elements in this cosmogony that we can't deny. It's true that um, uh, you have like at some point an important role for this, uh, for the women and for the um, uh, for this uh, for this way of looking at the gender. But at the same time. Uh, when you're looking at the way the power is transmitted, when you're uh, forgetting about the methodology of the Berber communities, it's more about matrilinearity than like matriarchy. It's more about like the power is transmitted by the 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 the, the sister of the she, but it doesn't mean that she is going to be like the new leader. Her son is going to be the leader, so the nephew. So that's important also to be able to nuance our thoughts about like the representation of the power. Uh, the private space versus the outside, basically the ehen versus the esuf. The esuf means the wild, means the danger, and is associated to the male, to the man. Uh, when we're thinking about the private space, we're thinking about the education, like the protection, uh, very uh, kind of uh, feminine attributes. And we are associating them to the uh, to the Tuareg women. So when we you when we are looking at other societies, we can see definitely that it's kind of very traditional, and we can see like other communities working in the same way. So, um, uh, however, they like insisting on the fact that they are somehow hidden advisors, they, uh, leading to the uh, to the decisions that as a discrete political advisors but is it like very different with other communities perhaps in the sahel they have like a, a more important role but when we're looking it at an international level we can question um, ourselves however it's very important and very uh, crystallized in our like representation of the trade woman and here you have a wonderful Painting of Keltum Welet uh, Emastar, which uh, who's um, a poet, a painter, an artist, a storyteller, um, a fascinating woman who's like quite present in international and francophone media, and at some point uh, a storyteller uh, explaining us the role of women in general, the twelve women in general, and you can see here a man advised around women who are like explaining him how to act and how to behave. So in um, Northern Mali, some leaders were telling me basically the representation of the power is represented in that way. So you have the women who are like representing education, the way to act in society, the morality, the behavior, the conduct. So all these elements are like, um, uh, for the basically um, portrayed by the woman figure. And you have like the Amin Okal, who's the traditional chief, and the Qadi Ulema for the juridic Muslim aspects, Islamic aspects. One sentence that I really liked when I was like interviewing um, women in, uh, in Mali is like this sentence, ce que la tresse dit la nuit, la barbe le fait le jour. What the bread says at night, the, the bird does it by the day. So basically, uh, we're deciding everything, uh, but we are not necessarily in public in the public space when we're saying it. But after that, it's going to happen. And many men were telling me, uh, notably in 2007 in uh, Niger, that in the region of Diaïr, or the Kelte Dele community, particularly, women were saying, like, the men are, like, fighting, the men are doing that when they, uh, when they were talking about the rebels, but uh, it was a way for them also to say that the other one are not men. So you can see also that the, uh, the masculinity is at some point defined um, in time of war, and the uh, and, uh, men are going to join eventually the rebellions because of that. And it happened. And they that's really present in the narratives for the 90s and also the, the recent rebellions. The concept of cosmogony is theorized by Claude Wawad, uh, but it's really um, associated to the voice of upper social classes. I'm not very sure 
that it's representing all the um, Tuareg societies, particularly that you can see that their own representations can vary depending of the context and depending of the relations with other communities around them. So to not understand them as like closed societies, but like as porous and necessarily open to their environment. However, the cosmogony in the way she was like framing it when it's about the private sphere and the public sphere and different aspects like that it seems that it's part of the uh, the collective the denom the common denominator of like when we're thinking more at the at the political level particularly with the nation aspect it's more um, it's harder to see that all the actors were sharing it uh, however like elites um, like intellectuals like uh, to um, to read Claude Wawa, they're like very interested by her work and nationalist uh, um, Tuareg are when they are talking to you and when you are like interviewing them, they are like thinking through these frames. So they like they using like basically the initial works of Ellen Claude Wawa and they are particularly aware of the work of, for example. Uh, Bernus uh, or like uh, Claude Awad or André Bourgeot. So at some point, you, you, we can see that we have an impact on the field and the data that we are collecting. We are also responsible of this data. So as a young scholar, I was like basically uh, exchanging with like Tuareg, but listening also Claude Awad through their own words. So, um, so that's like a methodological issue. Um, about the, the the diversity existing inside the, the this gender uh, division, let's say that we're talking about intersectionality here. We need to consider like social classes, education, modernity versus tradition, generation clashes. For example, um, all older generation, previous generations didn't want to let their daughters go to school. Now it's like a little bit changing. It depends also of, uh, on the area because they're fearing to, to lose their own identities, for example, in the region of Kidal. So here you have many different aspects uh, um, that can uh, lead to uh, different representation of women, urban versus rural area and the statutory uh, 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 realities in the tribe society, for example, like when you're like um, belonging to the Inadan uh, Forgeron uh, level, it's completely different than if you're like uh, from the uh, the noble classes of the Imrat. So we need to be aware of these divisions and we tend to erase them when we're thinking about the tribe woman because we have like this orientalist representation of this free woman. Um, so basically, we can see that uh, this way of looking at women only uh, in the traditional uh, norms in the private area are like complicating them to act in the public space at some point being elected, for example, and that's like the story of Nina Wallet in Talou, who, uh, who won initially the election to be mayor in Kidal, but couldn't become uh, sorry for this not couldn't become um, a mayor so it's revealing that okay we have like somehow traditional progressist norm but at the same time saying that women are like more in the private sphere it's and uh, it's creating issues to for their their political expression and some of them uh decided to go uh, further to go beyond and to ignore this norm and to, to fight against this representation. Uh, they are also uh, in economic activities by NGOs. They are framed in a, through a form of folklore, for example, like, uh, um, I don't know, uh, creating jewelries or like uh, this kind of activities, limiting their eventual roles in the society or through mu music. Like, uh, and uh, that's a way to, um, to save the tribe culture at some point, but it, it can't be only the way to look at the tribe women. And um, and of course, rivalries can exist between uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are like singers or like uh, in festivals, and they can also try to have like fundings and all of that. So you have like political realities happening between also artists. 
to just go fast, the drag women in the their role in the 90s, part in the 90s rebellion, basically they they were like singing, they were like uh, writing poems and like sharing poems to help like the fighters to continue like supporting them at some point. Uh, they had them for the fundings, um, organizing themselves to to have in the south of Algeria notably to have like some funds for the fighters. Um, logistics that they were working, uh, they were helping like uh, and collecting information basically. But uh, they were not really informed at the very beginning of the 90s about uh, that the, the beginning of the rebellion, which is not the case in 2012. They were like really informed and part of the of the ideological uh, fight uh, driven by the MNLA. Uh, the national movement in 2012. So you have this sentence that I really like because it's kind of summarizing the um, the effect of uh, events happening in the past and still echoing in the present and like uh, not disappearing in their representation. The women in Kidal were against the Algiers peace agreement because they were fearing that the militaries of the South were going to persecute them and to eventually rape them like they're like before, like the previous generation. So you have like this very strong imaginary still existing and reinforced with like the generations. And it's participating to this distance, to this um uh, tensions between Tuareg in Mali and uh, in the, uh, and the, the, the state, the Malian state. Uh, we, that which you are not like going to find in other societies like in Algeria, for example, or in Niger, because you don't have like this trauma, uh, this initial trauma of the uh, happening in 1960s in, in Mali. So uh, we are like in 2012, in 2012, Trump women were like portrayed as a key actresses to mobilize their communities, which is which was true. They were like also represented as like opposed to the jihadist groups because they are free women. So at some point, they're going to be against all these conservative values that they're going to try to impose to the Tuareg societies, which is true. Like you had like some um, uh, Tuareg women who were like really opposed to these norms. Uh, you have Tuareg women in 2014 uh, uh, protesting against the prime minister, uh, the visit of the prime minister in Kidal. Um, some Scholars, some militants, uh, pro governments were saying that they were instrumentalized by their own community. But you can see that they were sharing the, the vision of their community who were against basically the, the, the state at that moment. So it was like more like belonging to the society than like being instrumentalized to anything. Uh, the, the rebellion of um, uh, after that, in 2015, 2016, you have a rebellion of Tuareg women against uh, the ex-rebels, basically, because they opposed to the to the Algiers peace agreement. And the reason of this protest were quite easy to understand if you were like interviewing them. They were opposed. They were still opposed to the Malian state. They were like opposed to the peace agreement, and they were opposed mainly to the Tuareg men because they didn't um, ask them. Uh, what they wanted for the peace agreement, they were not uh, politically included in the in the agreement, and they didn't know at all what was basically uh, the elements of this agreement. So they were just not informed. And uh, you had like some actresses who tried to, um, let's say, uh, meet them. Uh, we can talk about work women elites and play the role of mediators, like for example, Keltum, we talked about her before, like the painter, the artist, and Nina Wallet in Tanu, the politician. And, uh, uh, and they, they helped, let's say, to explain uh, what was like the peace agreement and they, uh, and, uh, they, the, they um, shared some funding with the actresses, they helped them to understand that it was positive at some point for their societies and all that. But that was an issue. That was an issue because we were like uh, forgetting basically the Tuareg women in the process. But there's another issue. 
we are talking about two brokers here and uh, that uh, are like going to represent twerk women but they are also entrepreneurs and they can like um, have uh, used their statue uh, in a way like strategy of extraversion basically to cap to attract some fundings and we don't know if you if they are really going to share it proportionally to all the actresses so we have still an issue when we are like meeting these actresses uh, to consider them as representing the whole um, category of people, but the same problem is happening with them than with other kind of elites. So we need to be cautious to not be like to uh, to not be naive when we are like even um, uh, having some proxy or brokers to for like for example developmental uh, programs and all of that. So to, to go more uh, into media representation, you can see that uh, basically our sample, were col uh, I, we collected sample between 2010 and 2022 with my students, 2010, between 2010 and the beginning of the rebellion in 2022, uh, tw uh, 12, sorry. Uh, it was bef before uh, basically any um, conflict, so peaceful time. After that, during the conflict, 2012 and 2015, and after that, post-conflict, more or less. Uh, you can see in uh, the representations that basically, when we're looking between 2010 and 2022, the traditional role of women is the most represented in the media. After that, you have like the women as victims and uh, as resistant. Uh, we can see that it's kind of the the classic representation that we can have, like when we're depicting uh, women, like basically uh, victims. That's uh, in feminist literature, we can see that's like a very uh, uh, embedded representation when we're looking at civil conflict. But uh, tr the traditional role is more about like the, this very specific society when we tend to look at the women for their traditional uh, particularities. Um, what's interesting, I'm gonna share particularly with you like the difference between international media and, inter and local one. We can see a difference then in local media, we are like more focusing on the traditional role. So they're going to try to go more with like the autochthonous representation of the world. And we can understand this, uh, why they're going to uh, insist on that, like the authenticity of Africa at some point. But um, in international uh, media, you're going to see that they're going to depict them more like through the victim's angle. Uh, resistance is not really discussed uh, in local media, more in international one, particularly against jihadists. And, um, uh, and uh, they're gonna have to focus uh, a little bit on the uh, appearance, like basically the beauty, but more in, in local uh, media, they're going to focus a lot on the beauty and uh, less in the international one. So um, we can understand also this difference because of the representation of our sample you can see that between 2010 and 2012, before the rebellion, um, the, the international media were like talking a lot about the, the, the twerk women and it's decreasing uh, with the time and the local media are now talking more and more about this figure and the orientalism existing in the representations of twerk women in international media is also present in local media. It's not like something only of outsiders or anything. Local actors are depicting in a quite naive way also drag women, which is interesting. Like the Orientalism is not only from the outside, it's also inside. And we can even consider that perhaps there's like a, um, a form of contamination or spread of a representation of drag women. So uh, just to, um, to uh, I'm like uh, getting some slides to to have to give you like some contents of like a so uh, a variety of content and we can talk a little bit more about like uh, uh, let's say the the subtleties. Um, 
When I was interviewing Tuareg women in Northern Mali and asking them for their expectations in politics, uh, I discovered that, uh, or like to be more integrated in the, in, in the state, they were like asking for economic support, uh, microfunding like in the 90s, but, um, but more than that, they wanted like some programs uh, integrating them like in the long term, not only like small projects. Um, the second aspect was like professional training that they, they didn't want only like uh, uh, short term training, like, um, for example, how to make some soaps, because you have like some small businesses like that, but uh, also for the for the young uh, generations like the, their daughters and all that. Um, they were talking about uh, uh, asking for more inclusion of the young women in the state institutions, uh, basically that they can be like uh, in the administration, that they can work in the state authorities like men. They, they wanted more um, training about what's la politique. For them, la politique is like about uh, elections. It's about like uh, being... Uh, members of a port political parties and all that why they need to to be part of it uh, uh what's what are the gains for the community and for them to be involved and they were like talking a lot about it in their in the interviews that i that i had with this ngo azar we we did it mainly in gao and uh in kidal uh they were asking for more justice um that was quite sensitive because uh, they, when it's about like uh, sexual crimes and all those, all of that, uh, a lot of them are like uh, going to uh, stop the process uh, eventually, and uh, you will not have the trial because they fearing uh, the shame as uh, um, other kind of case studies that we can see. So you have like the same issue there. And the uh, dialogue between communities and women, basically, they were asking more uh, dialogue, dialogue between Sahelian communities and women, but also their own communities, integrating, integrating them more in the process. So basically, here a few elements to discuss. Uh, of course, uh, I didn't cover the, all the aspects, but I will be uh, very happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you. Adib, thank you so much for this really fascinating um, presentation and I appreciate the map at the beginning because I think that you know we 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 sort of know about the Tuareg but where are they exactly and I hear you know I hear about them from the Moroccan perspective and that, yeah there's Tuareg sort of in the south but um, this was really really enlightening um, so now we can open up it up to questions and if those of you who are um, attending if you want to unmute and speak you're welcome to do that. Um, or if you'd like to put something in the chat, I'm happy to read your, your question. And as, as we're waiting for comments and questions from the audience, I actually have two questions. Um, so, so my first one has to do with relation to the state. That was fascinating me. And I don't know if my question can be specific enough, but you talked about them, the, the Tuareg women being anti-state in Mali, within the Malian context. What about in general, the idea of the state? Um, and I guess that's a broader question too, to the Tuareg being traditionally nomadic and having a sort of identity that is not tied to a, you know, sort of a modern post-World War II nation state. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Do you want me to answer right now or like you have the second sure. one? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So, um you definitely right about the anti state in Mali, particularly in the region of Kidal. That's a nuance that I needed to add even for like northern Mali because you have like for example communities like Kelansar who are like not opposed to the Malian state and uh, at some point, you have these Kelansar women living in Bamako who are able to develop some um, strategies to obtain some help from their communities living in Bamako, but also from other like links that they are like able to develop in the capital. And there's like a fascinating article in a 
um, Les Cahiers de l'Ouest Saharien, uh, recently published by, uh, by a young scholar um, who's talking about it. So it depends also about the communities, even in Mali, because they are like, quite divided. But uh, to talk, for example, about Algeria, um, you have uh, this representation of like this Berber powerful figure, like it's like part of like this uh, Berber imaginaries existing in, uh, in Algeria. You have like some this fascina fascination in terms of beauty because it's like the classic 19th century representation of like the, the beauty of this, ori this Orient. Uh, and uh, basically for women are like one of these representations. Um, but you have also uh, some, um, let's say, initiatives made by the state. Uh, and I can show you like the, the, I don't know if you're going to be able to see like the, the book, but um, it's about, about the Imzad. Uh, it's written by Farida Selel. It's like a very, a very huge work that she did. Um, Few decades ago, I will say, uh, because she was like the wife of the ex prime minister, and she was particularly engaged in the south and like living with them and all that. And she uh, wanted to promote the Tuareg woman through the music. So basically, the state did a lot to um, to to promote Tuareg women, but through the artists. Um, uh, for, for artistic elements. So that's, um, let's say, an Algerian initiative, but, uh, and framing at some point women as like only artists, and uh, that's, not, uh, that's not enough. Um, uh, so that's for the, the Algeria. In the case of Niger, it's quite of a mix. Uh, communities are like, uh, marrying each other you have like more like mixed families particularly in the south with like southern Tuareg communities like Kilgaris um, so uh, um, I think it's the dialogue happening is more like in uh, very Nigerian like between like for example uh, Jerma communities Aousa communities Tuareg and all that and it depends of the locality what I can say also is about this um, cliche of the twerk women who are not wearing veil, but men are really wearing the turban, the veil. And we are saying quite a lot that in this society, the men are like covering their face to, to hide their emotions, but women can show the, uh, themselves to, to the world. And that's the difference between other societies, like uh, other Muslim societies. But the fact is that you can still see like communities wearing veils differently, not in a conservative way. So you can see the whole face and even hairs. But um, depending on the reason, if uh, you have more conservative values around, you can't um, tell that correct societies are not going to be infused by their environment. At some point, these values are going to be also um, integrated and uh, spread in their communities. And in northern Niger, I was like in uh, in in Gal. I saw like many people were like really covering their face, particularly when they were like in present of in presence of in, uh, foreigners or men uh, who are not part of the communities. So we need to nuance a little bit our kind of representation of twelve women. Uh, it was like a large question, uh, large answer, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's just really fascinating. I was just reflecting. I, I spent a very short amount of time, a couple of times with some um, female nomads in Southern Morocco near Merzouga. And it was just interesting because the men were all gone. They were out um, with their wild, with their sheep and just, they weren't there, right? And the women were there, which seemed very vulnerable. Um, seemed like they were very vulnerable. And I, you know, I spoke with them in, in Moroccan Arabic, which they spoke, but it was not, you know, it was a little bit of a difficult communication. It seemed like they were, there wasn't a complete trust or connection with the Moroccan state, yeah. um, but there was this idea, one woman wants to move into town, so she has a, you know, a domicile in town, so her kids can go to school, and I, I thought, wow, that's interesting, because it's sort of schooling is sort of, you know, part of the nationalization process, right, or the socialization within the nation state. 
Uh, I completely agree, and uh, you can see that some Tuareg who are like going to university or like uh, going in capitals and all that are like trying to help their milieu to uh, to accept more the school because even at the colonial times that was like one one of the communities resisting a lot uh, uh, to to um, for like uh, to go to schools and basically it was hard to have like nomads. Uh, uh, to have like resources for nomads to go to schools, but um, so you have like uh, and uh, you have like some of them who are living in rural area like in northern Niger, in Gala, Fukada, Chintabaraden, who don't want to go to schools, even like young women, uh, and who don't want to the, um, even schools for their kids. Um, and some of them consider that it's like a good leverage for like the kids to uh, to be able to, for example, create an NGO to help their communities and all that. So you can still you you still have a debate inside these societies when you are like in rural area. That's not like uh, uh, something that we can say that it's uh, not automatism or like they convinced by the state. You're absolutely right. It's still happening. Yeah. So interesting. Thank you. Um, so love to have others join in this conversation. Um, I see Aisha, Blair, David, Liddy, Sarah, Selma, if I got your names right, please feel free. Um, I think Skylar can open you up or make you a panelist so you can just speak or if you'd like to. Okay, I do see something in the Q of A. Yeah, um, I can see a question already from Aisha Azawi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Benchuri, for this very informative presentation. What are some of the differences and similarities between Tuareg and Amazigh women from Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia? Great That's question. an excellent question, <laughs> a big one. Uh, I can't talk a lot about like uh, Morocco and Tunisia because I didn't really uh, explore that uh, exhaustively. But in the case of Algeria, we can see that you have like the particularities of Tuareg societies still existing in this Tuareg world. But in the Algerian imagination is going to be linked to the Berber world in general. So it depends if you you have like a, um, people who are like going to uh, connect the um, the Tuareg women to the Berber identity. It's going we're gonna talk about the, the Tamazra or like it's going to be Pan Berber and they're going to try to connect, for example, the Kahina, uh, which is like a the princess, uh, the rebel uh, who was against the Arab invaders, uh, and also like some myths uh, in the south, like uh, for example, Tinhinen, or uh, about the Tuareg figure. So it can happen, and it's going to happen in a specific imaginaries, like pro Berber. Um, you have the Haut Commissariat à la Mesirité. Uh, who's doing a very interesting work to promote the Amazigh identity in Algeria. And of course, uh, he's going to promote it through an Algerian perspective, a national perspective. And uh, even if he's exploring, uh, for example, what's happening in Gardaya or what's happening in Kabylie or, or like in the antiquity to, to go in a, through a historical work, uh, they're going to try to put all together as part of the Algerian cultural legacy. So that's also framed by the actors talking. But when you're talking with like old Tuareg in the South, because I was there in February uh, last year and uh, in Taman Rasset, they were not necessarily linking like Kabil with like the Tuareg uh, societies and their own norms and the Tuareg women. Uh, they discovered this connection during the Berber Spring uh, in the 1980s, the, the, the protests uh, of the Kabyle communities. And at that time, they discovered that they were part of a, a bigger community. Um, but for the young generations in social media, you can see that they were referring to the Tamazra and trying to connect uh, the progressist woman figure in the Tuareg societies as like a way to, to defend the women rights in, the, in Algeria, even in Muslim communities, and uh, connecting it to the progressist way of looking at things in the Berber, uh, in the Kabyle societies and all that. So you have like this 
um, normative, let's say, uh, projects are happening uh, in uh, the narrative of young generations. And uh, some com some young generations who are not even part of like the Tureg world or like the uh, the Kabyle world are like also uh, believing on this um, this belonging, this uh, this uh, um, legacy, verbal legacy, and promoting this uh, progressist way of looking at women. So you can have like this very interesting way of trying to use this traditional uh, romanticized time about the role of women in the Berber societies to try to improve their like rights and uh, in the in the current society uh, some feminist scholars are talking about it as a, a very African way of doing feminism uh, nego feminism like a feminism in negotiation with their environment so I think it's happening too in Algeria. So interesting. Wow. Aisha, do you want to follow up with anything? Feel free Merci. if you'd like to. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Comments, questions? We have a few more minutes. Again, you can type them in the chat or you can just um, unmute and talk. Skylar, what about you? Skylar is, a, is our coordinator for communications, but he's also a, a graduate student looking to embark on a PhD soon. Yeah. I've just been enjoying just kind of um, soaking it in. I guess I'm really struck just by the kind of ethnographic complexity, just how many layers and kind of how many vocabularies are being interwoven. Um, not kind of just in our discussion, let alone in the, the subject and the topic of what we're actually having this conversation about. Um, and that's why I really appreciated even just kind of the, the nuance in the title of how uh, how holistic your approach really seemed to be. And I especially appreciate that this came out of um, and kind of that you shared with us the elements of your own biography, that there was kind of a, a, a challenge that you found within your own work and finding those own biases within yourself. Um, I think it's it's exciting and I'm excited, especially by work that centers that kind of process as praxis and I think you really seem to be um on a, on a cusp of that and really innovating something with that so I just wanted to say I appreciate that other than that I'm um really really struck by what you were just talking about these kind of emerging discourses of resistance um kind of uncovering some of these even historical um historical narratives going back in varying lengths of immediate history and even mentions kind of even going all the way back to antiquity, um, different ways of thinking about these identities, whether it be along racialized lines, ethnic lines, um, kind of again, all of these interlocking um, elements of identity. So I guess I'm just curious what other expressions, you mentioned also some of the literature that you've um, been studying. I'm curious about kind of just the intersection there of these narratives of resistance, uncovering as a uh, uncovering historical narratives perhaps as a mode of resistance and how that's actually being expressed culturally in kind of a younger generation um is that coming through in art is it music i know we've actually worked we, we talked a bit last time in the um uh with professor tolan skilnick about some of the amazing work that's being done in hip-hop right now by both Susie o sociologists and ethnomusicologists um, about kind of modes of resistance being expressed in North Africa, particularly through hip hop. I'm wondering if you can speak to anything like that kind of currently ethnographically. So uh, so I met some uh, guys who were like doing more raps uh, in terms of resistance that was like more the their way of, um, uh, notably in Algeria, uh, depending of like uh, the type of singers. Uh, yeah, 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 it was mainly raps for like the, the south of um, Algeria with like more Tuareg societies, I will say that it's more about like folklore, traditional uh, uh, ways of um, of singing and uh, uh, more about like um, promoting the Tamashek culture. You have like new generations, but it's not uh, uh, even like an Algerian group that I was listening recently, but it's not necessarily uh, politically uh, engaged. Um, I will say that in the literature you will find, uh, and in social media in general, you will find like more the activism um, in uh, in uh, in literature, in novels, 
you're going to find um, kind of an orientalist aspect for what I'm reading now, uh, fascination for the South. It's like um, linking the nomadic figure, uh, the true one, like the living in the desert, with like a postmodern way of looking at nomad, like uh, um, like in a Deleuzean way, in a very postmodern way. So as someone who can uh, deconstruct its words, who will, um, who uh, don't have the same biases as us in our like societies and all that. So you have a form of projection in the literature, which is interesting because it can be super creative. Um, uh, you have also in uh, um, many things who are like shared through uh, WhatsApp groups, and uh, that's uh, and it's private. And uh, that's hard to get to be uh, to to be uh, inside these debates happening. You can have it then more or less in uh, on Facebook, and uh, it's more accessible. And uh, here you can have like these narratives happening all the time, and people like repeating stories and reconstructing their understanding of resistance in uh, uh, as nomad or as Algerians or rediscovering even their own identities as nomads because or as Tuareg because you have many guys who are like very urban, educated and all that or like trying to go back to their past, trying to make sense to their own identity and project it uh, publicly. Uh, and it's uh, and it's happening like with the new guys on social media. So it's definitely an ecosystem that I want to explore. This um, um, uh, through it, uh, we can say ethnography basically, uh, and uh, even interviewing the young guys uh, in Taman Rasset uh, who are like urban but still um, um, saying, claiming that they are nomads, which is interesting. <laughs> And Adip, we have two Hi. other questions and they're kind of related. Um, we have five more minutes. So maybe I could just sort of summarize both questions. You may be able to see them. So one is in the chat um, from Blair who says, in Mali, any links between Tuareg and other Malian women, um, socially, traditions? And then David asks, um, thanks you for the lecture and says, are there foreign forces involved? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are different questions, but. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for like the first question about, uh, I was like uh, exchanging with um, a Bambara woman who's a leader in uh, like uh, one of the key political institutions in Mali, and she told me, well, we need more discussions between women in the Sahel, uh, notably between Tuareg and uh, Southern communities, because at some point we can learn things from the uh, Tuareg women, and they can also. Uh, uh, learn more about like our respective cultures. Um, uh, for example, uh, we, you have less polygamy happening in uh, Tuareg societies, and it's definitely not uh, a practice appreciated and tolerated, uh, contrary to other Sahelian communities. And it can be interesting to see an evolution of norms through um, a dialogue. So they were like. Um, aware of uh, when we're talking about like elites or educated women um, about an interesting discussion which can happen if we're like uh, trying to have it uh, um, uh, spread uh, in the region. Um, about uh, the foreign forces, uh, I know that MINUSMA was like UN uh, mission was like trying to have like some programs. Uh, I know that uh, uh, some actor, actors like um, uh, Sweden was like trying to have a women empowerment program. Canada too is like uh, one of the key actors with a feminist um, voice uh, in terms of foreign policy. And I remember an anecdote just to finish with like a, a story. When I was like uh, discussing with like a traditional leader in uh, in uh, an Amenokal, and I'm not going to tell you like the community here, <laughs> But uh, in uh, in northern Mali, I was like um, asking him questions about women that I wanted to discuss with women, and that uh, uh, particularly if you if he has like some women elites who are like representing their communities and all that, and he was you Canadians, you like trying to give like the poor to women. Uh, that, that that's a really Western view of doing things, and I was like oh. 
quite shocked because at the same time during discussions with these communities, they were like talking a lot about the role of women in their societies who are like free and when they are free, they are like uh, very progressive, that they are like uh, playing an important part of like the political reality of their communities. But he was resisting to to have me uh, interviewed like for a woman and eventually developed like more women empowerment program because it's changing the internal dynamics in their societies too and on the, on the ground and they're having less resources too for them. So that's uh, also uh, interesting to see, let's say. So it's complicated. Yes, as and usual. And, as usual and nuanced. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and influences go in all different directions. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Well, I want to thank you so much. If we were in person, we'd all give you a big round of applause. Thank we you. Thank you. Do it virtually. Um, and we've gotten some thank yous in the chat. This was really great, really interesting and dynamic. Um, and yeah, we look forward to you coming out to Arizona at some point. Ah, I hope, inshallah. Yeah. I will, I will inshallah. be happy about uh, joining yeah. you guys. Yeah, absolutely.